So good morning, everybody. Why don't we get started? I have the pleasure of moderating today's Ethics Grand Rounds and introducing our two speakers. Before I do that, however, I wanted to take a few minutes to remind everybody of the format of this Ethics Grand Rounds. It's really meant to be a case-based consideration of an ethical issue in pediatrics, and the case that we present is inspired by actual events, but is generally modified and is intended as a starting place to consider the issues raised. The case will be presented by a children's clinician for today's Grand Rounds. It will be Dr. Kim Ahrens, who I will introduce shortly. There will be an opportunity to ask questions of clarification after the case is presented. The case will be followed by a commentary for 15 to 20 minutes by our invited guest, Dr. Paul Applebaum. After the commentary, we want to stimulate discussion, and I invite you to make your way to the aisles in order to use the microphones situated there if you would like to ask a question or have comments. Lastly, I wanted to mention that Ethics Grand Rounds is sponsored by the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and is supported by a fund established by Jeff Sconiers and Deborah Godfrey. Ethics Grand Rounds occurs quarterly. The date of the next Ethics Grand Rounds is May 13th and will feature guest presenter Sadeth Saeed from Boston Children's speaking about when parents make life and death decisions in the NICU based upon cultural views about disability. So on to introductions. Our case presenter and first speaker today is Dr. Kim Ahrens, who many of you know is one of our adolescent medicine physicians here at Children's. Kim is an acting instructor and senior research fellow in the Adolescent Medicine Division of the Department of Pediatrics. She did her medical school training at the University of Iowa and residency, fellowship, and public health training here at the University of Washington. Her research interest is in designing interventions to promote healthy relationships and improve adult outcomes for adolescents in the foster system. Our commentator on the issues raised by today's case is Dr. Paul Applebaum. Dr. Applebaum is the Elizabeth K. Dollard Professor of Psychiatry, Medicine, and Law and Director of the Division of Psychiatry, Law, and Ethics in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Applebaum is past president of the American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law, and the Massachusetts Psychiatric Society. He has received numerous awards for his contributions to psychiatry and has been elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Applebaum is the author of many articles and books in law and ethics in clinical practice, including Assessing Competence to cons Consent to Treatment, a Guide for Physicians and Other Healthcare Professionals. We are delighted to have Dr. Applebaum here today. So without further delay, delay let's get started with the case presentation, Dr. Ahrens. Thank you, Doug, and thanks, everybody. Um, before I present this case, I just want to acknowledge that um, personally, this was a case that I thought was very medically and psychosocially challenging um, that I learned a lot from. I was part of this case during my uh, clinical adolescent medicine year um, and uh, felt that it was a very educational experience to be a part of this case, and I hope that um, you have the same experience as we present her today. Um, my plan is to uh, go through um, uh, this patient's initial presentation and then take you briefly through her hospital course up to about the first three months of her care here at Children's. She spent a prolonged stay here. Um, but at three months, that was the time at which um, a lot of the ethical issues became prominent and I think will be a good point um, to leave off to start the discussion. Okay. So um, our patient is Casey. She is an 18-year-old who is admitted for acute dehydration, hyperthermia, and severe malnutrition. She's actually been airlifted um, from a tropical vacation destination uh, for um, management of acute renal failure associated with rhabdomyolysis. Uh, she, uh, her story is that she's had progressive caloric restriction and weight loss over the past six months. Um, Casey attributes when you talk to her that her initial weight loss was due to um, depressive symptoms, um, which she attributes to several psychosocial stressors, including um, having a difficult breakup with her boyfriend with whom she was living at the time. 
However, over the last one to two months prior to presentation at Children's, uh, she began having severe abdominal pain and bilious emesis whenever she ate, uh, but in spite of her severe symptoms and a weight loss of approximately 40 pounds, she uh, failed to seek medical care uh, for these symptoms. Her current presentation, as I mentioned, is precipitated by a family vacation, which Casey took uh, in spite of a progressive weakness and inability to walk over the one to two weeks prior to the vacation. And uh, she was actually required a wheelchair to make it through the airport to get to her plane. Uh, during her vacation, she sunbathed and developed um, an acute hyperthermia, dehydration, um, and rhabdomyolysis. Casey's past medical history is significant for um, a diagnosis of bulimia, which she acquired four years ago. Uh, she's had very poor follow-up and medical care for this condition and states that she no longer has an eating disorder. She also has a history of substance abuse, which began with some methamphetamine use prior to the age of, eight, of 13, excuse me, um, and a mood disorder. She's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In addition, around the time of her diagnosis of bulimia, she had an episode uh, where she had a Tylenol overdose and required a, stay, a short stay in our PICU here. Um, in terms of social history, uh, she was living with her boyfriend until the start of the current illness and now lives with her mother. She is currently accompanied by her mother and aunt uh, today. Uh, her mother also, like Casey, denies that Casey has an eating disorder and is convinced of a medical etiology for Casey's symptoms. Her aunt, however, on discussions alone, um, believes that Casey never recovered from her previous eating disorder and specifically notes that Casey tends to make trips to the bathroom after every meal. Casey's physical exam is remarkable for um, an initial weight on presentation to children of 34.4 kilos. Uh, which for uh, Casey's height and age is approximately 57% of the expected. She has severe orthostasis, severe psychomotor retardation, and slurring of speech on presentation, which over the course of approximately a week with tube feedings resolved. She also has severe abdominal pain and a petechial rash overlying her ab abdomen. Her initial labs and studies were remarkable for a glucose of 30, bicarbonate of 34, which is consistent with chronic vomiting, a prolonged QTC interval of 524, a markedly elevated creatine kinase in the 4700s, and a hematocrit of 46.7, consistent with hemoconcentration. So as you can see, a fairly severe initial presentation. Um, over the first several months of her hospital course, um, she, uh, after her acute uh, renal failure and hydration issues had been resolved, an attempt at refeeding was made and she developed bilious emesis consistent with her history. She was eventually diagnosed with acute pancreatitis and cholecystitis and for that was made NPO and started on nasojejunal feeds. Uh, given the fact that she was over 18, consent for all of her care, including the um, uh, as consent for a cholecystectomy, were obtained from the patient herself rather than from the family, which would be the norm for patients here at Children's. Um, Casey was uh, uniformly resistant to treatments that caused her to gain weight, and that included increases in her nasojejunal feeds, uh, total parental total parenteral nutrition, and uh, oral diets when they were attempted. She was also noted on several occasions uh, by nursing staff to engage in surreptitious behaviors consistent with an eating disorder, and that included refusing to be monitored in the bathroom and um, having her tube feeds uh, turned off when nursing staff was not in the room. Uh, she also consistently refused, both with the primary team and also with my service, the Adolescent Medicine Service, as well as the Psychiatry Service, to engage in discussions regarding anorexia as part of the underlying etiology of her medical problems, and would continue to state, I do not have an eating disorder, as she did initially. So I'd like to just briefly um, take a minute, take a step back from the case, and um, give you a little bit of information about anorexia. Uh, anorexia nervosa affects approximately 0.3 to 1% of all women. That's the lifetime prevalence. Uh, it is a potentially fatal condition and is actually has the highest death rate of any psychiatric illness. 
uh, current studies indicate about 6.2%. There are other studies that indicate up to a 20% uh, death rate for uh, anorexia and it related comorbidities for people with this diagnosis. Um, it's also important to note that like our patient, most patients initially diagnosed with anorexia experience some degree of denial regarding their condition. And I would say, uh, in my experience, the vast majority of patients have some degree of denial regarding their condition. Uh, the dsm 4 criteria for anorexia include weight loss or failure to gain weight leading to a body weight of less than 85% of that expected for age and height, an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat even though underweight, a disturbed experience of one's body or shape, undue influence of weight or shape on self-evaluation, or denial of the seriousness of the current low body weight, and amenorrhea unless on hormonal contraception. And I've bolded the criteria that our patient fits. Um, one caveat to that, for those who know the case, uh, for this patient in particular, amenorrhea, and this is often the case for anorexic patients and who are on the severe end of the spectrum, um, it was difficult to assess uh, whether she was truly amenorrheic, although it was strongly suspected. Um, so in terms of initial treatment for anorexia, um, once the diagnosis is made or suspected, the initial treatment is administered by a, an interdisciplinary team. That includes a physician, ideally with expertise in eating disorders, uh, a nutritionist and a mental health therapist. And we have the following goals when we begin treatment. The first is restoration of weight. The second is prevention of complications of refeeding syndrome. And the third is progressive acceptance of the condition and treatment by the patient and their family. And those goals we attempt to achieve simultaneously. So back to our case. Um, so Casey, um, uh, over the course of her uh, first three months of hospitalization here, continued to uh, have difficulty with um, any treatments that um, assisted her in gaining weight and also had uh, difficulty engaging in any conversations with either the psychiatry or adolescent medicine service um, related to um, treatment of her uh, eating issues. Uh, so therefore, uh, we engaged in a conference, which included members of our inpatient eating disorder team. Um, and after a long discussion, um, we as a service began encouraging the primary team to use the term starvation syndrome to engage Casey in discussions regarding an inpatient stay for her treatment uh, for her low weight and eating difficulties once her medical issues, acute medical issues had been treated um, as a term that might be less um, inflammatory to this particular patient. Um, and our backup plan, after a discussion with the Adolescent Medicine Service, the primary service, and the psychiatry service, um, was to attempt to commit her for treatment involuntarily if she attempted to leave against medical advice. And an affidavit indicating this was placed in her chart. So. Um, these are the ethical questions that arose at this point in time, um, prompted largely by the primary team. Uh, and I'm going to now turn it over to my colleagues to initiate the discussion around this. So while you all are mulling over these questions, I want to pause for a second and ask if anybody has clarifications for Kim regarding the case. No, all right. Well, let's move on to Dr. Applebaum's commentary. Okay. Um, first of all, let me uh, say how uh, pleased I am to, uh, to be here in Seattle with you. I, I uh, always enjoy the city, and I fully intend to go back to New York after this trip and tell people how warm and sunny it is here <laughs> in January. So uh, you'll have a good ambassador in, in, uh, in me. Um, let me uh, bring up my own uh, slide set uh, here. Um, okay. So um, I am not an expert on uh, anorexia uh, nervosa uh, per se. 
Uh, and uh, I'm sure many of you in the audience know a lot more about the, uh, about the disease uh, than I do. The, the focus of, of my comments is going to be on uh, some of the ethical uh, aspects of uh, dealing with a very, very difficult uh, case uh, like this, specifically uh, the nature of decisional competence and its particular permutations uh, in cases of anorexia, uh, the requirements for disclosure of diagnosis to patients, which addresses the question of what do we call this syndrome uh, that uh, the patient has, uh, and then uh, finally uh, some differences uh, in the treatment of minors and uh, adults, including those people who just straddle that border, uh, are just under majority or just over majority. In this case, we had a, a woman who uh, had exceeded the age uh, of majority. So first to say something about uh, decisional competence or decisional capacity. I think the terms uh, can be used interchangeably. Uh, it, it, is, it has become over the last uh, two, almost three decades now, I think generally accepted, uh, that when we talk about standards for decisional capacity, we're talking about these four uh, elements of uh, decisional capacity. And, and let me just tick, them, tick through them uh, with you uh, briefly. Uh, the first of the four components of this compound approach to decisional capacity asks whether the patient has the ability to evidence a choice. Uh, so at the simplest level, patients who are comatose, patients who are uh, so psychotic that they can't uh, uh, be understood, uh, patients who have uh, a stroke and are any, unable to uh, communicate uh, clearly need someone else to make the decisions uh, for them. And of course, kids are in a somewhat different situation in, in that as a matter of law, they are uh, considered to be unable to evidence at least a legally uh, valid uh, choice. Uh, but it's not always that uh, straightforward. So sometimes you'll have patients who can evidence a choice, uh, their problem is that they evidence too many choices. That is, in the morning, they're willing to go through with the procedure. By lunchtime, uh, they've changed their mind. Three in the afternoon, they're back on board again. And then uh, by the evening, no, they don't want to, uh, uh, to go through with it. So they have a problem in evidencing an effective choice. And that's not to say that people can't be ambivalent uh, or can't change their minds. But to the extent that that uh, ambivalence is reflective of an underlying psychiatric or neurologic uh, condition or a general medical condition that may be impacting their uh, mentation, uh, they too may be considered uh, to lack capacity on the basis of inability to evidence uh, a choice. Uh, the second criterion, the second uh, element of, uh, of this standard uh, is uh, understanding. That is, we ask, does the patient have the ability to understand the information uh, that's relevant to uh, their decision? And that is, in general, the information that is uh, required uh, to be disclosed by physicians uh, to their patients under the doctrine of informed consent. So quickly, the uh, nature of the patient's condition, that turns out to be important in this case, uh, the nature and uh, purpose of the proposed treatment, the likely benefits of the proposed treatment, the risks of the proposed treatment, uh, and uh, the alternatives, the reasonable alternatives that may exist to that proposed treatment, along with their risks and benefits. We're required to disclose all five of those uh, uh, pieces of information to uh, patients, and they need to have the capacity uh, to understand a reasonable disclosure uh, about uh, those issues. Now, in some jurisdictions, uh, we would stop there. So if I were giving this talk in Wisconsin right now, in, in Milwaukee or Madison, uh, I would say, well, under uh, Wisconsin state law, really, if you've got the ability to evidence a choice and you can understand, you have the ability to understand disclosed information, uh, we're done. You're uh, competent to make decisions. Uh, however, in, as far as I know, every other uh, jurisdiction uh, in the country, we don't. Uh, stop there. Uh, that is, we ask two additional questions. One is, does the patient have the ability to appreciate the implications of the information for their own uh, situation? So that uh, 
to, to consider the difference between understanding and appreciation. Uh, the patient who says to you, as perhaps this patient did, look, doc, I understand that you're telling me that you think I have an eating disorder. So she understands what it is we're communicating to her. Uh, but I know I don't have an eating disorder. I have this problem in my gallbladder, in my pancreas, uh, whatever the explanation is. Uh, this is a patient who has understanding, can comprehend the meaning of the words that we say, but who lacks the ability to appreciate the implications of that information for their own situation. And that's most commonly manifest with denial of the existence of or the nature of a medical condition or denial of the likely efficacy of uh, treatment. Finally, uh, we ask uh, for patients who have understanding and appreciation of the disclosed information, can they take that information and use it in some sort of rational process of weighing risks and benefits uh, in order to come out with uh, their choice? Uh, can they go through something that looks like uh, a rational process of reasoning? Now, we don't take it too far because uh, the law doesn't demand that we all make rational decisions. In fact, few of us uh, make uh, consistently uh, rational decisions. The more we learn about human decision making, uh, the smaller that, that, no, that group of people seems to, uh, seems to become. Uh, however, we at least arguably have the capacity to weigh risks and benefits of uh, a variety of situations that we're confronted with, and that's really what we're asking for here. And these standards and, and issues related to assessment of capacity are elaborated more fully in the article uh, that I've cited uh, at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide. There are a couple relevant additional characteristics of competence, just uh, very quickly. Um, some of which are, are clearly relevant uh, to this case. So uh, first, uh, for centuries, uh, we talked about competence uh, as a general unifying uh, concept that applied to uh, all of a person's uh, capacities. So a person was either competent to do everything in their lives or incompetent to do anything uh, in their lives. Uh, and this was generally true until the early 1960s, approximately, when the President's Commission on Mental Retardation, appointed by President Kennedy, issued a report that pointed out that people with mental retardation uh, are often quite capable of making some decisions in their lives, but not making others. And that the limitations on their ability, their legal abilities uh, to make choices ought to be crafted, tailored, to encompass those areas where they're having problems, managing a trust fund, for example, for uh, the fortunate ones, uh, and allow them to make decisions in those areas where they can. For example, where to live, who their friends uh, may be, what physicians should be delivering uh, their medical care, uh, and, uh, and the like. And that notion has become so widely adopted, well beyond uh, people with mental retardation, uh, that in general now we look at specific and not uh, global uh, competence. Now there's still some people who are globally uh, incompetent. At the end of her life, my mother suffered from uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, and was clearly incapable of uh, managing any aspect of her life. I was her port appointed her guardian with uh, plenary uh, capacities to uh, make decisions uh, on her behalf. So that, that's still relevant in a number of uh, circumstances. But when we're talking about competence to consent to medical treatment, it is really a specific capacity. You can be incompetent as a result of delusional ideation, for example, or denial of a disorder to consent to medical treatment while you're perfectly capable of managing your financial affairs. Uh, and to deprive you of the power of doing one does no, no longer means that uh, you're automatically deprived uh, of the power to do uh, the other. The second characteristic of, of competence that's uh, relevant uh, in this case and important to keep in mind is what we might call task specificity. Uh, that is, even within competence to consent to uh, medical treatment, whether someone is capable of actually making a specific decision 
may depend on what that decision is. So consider uh, someone, uh, for example, who has a very focal delusion about um, the, uh, uh, the person who's uh, their surgeon. Uh, who is uh, proposing to uh, excise uh, a breast lump. Uh, and I have seen such patients uh, in the past. I remember one woman who believed that the surgeon was in cahoots with her nephew who wanted to kill her on the operating room table so that he could take her estate, which consisted of nothing. She was supported on uh, SSDI. Um, this was a woman who clearly was not capable of making a decision about the biopsy and removal of that uh, mass in her breast, which most people thought was probably uh, cancerous. Um, but she was perfectly capable of deciding whether or not to have a flu shot or getting routine medical care or taking her psychiatric medications, uh, interestingly. So even within capacity to make decisions about medical care, we need to focus on, and we do focus on, the specific task uh, at hand. And then finally, there's the issue of temporal specificity. That is, whether or not somebody is competent may depend on when we are asking uh, about. So to take the obvious example, people with Alzheimer's disease uh, who may be relatively sharp uh, in the morning, mild Alzheimer's disease, mild to moderate, uh, may sundown uh, by later in the day and no longer be capable of understanding or processing uh, information that's uh, communicated uh, to them. Competent in the morning, not in the evening. Someone who comes in in electrolyte imbalance and delirium may be incompetent at that point, but once their uh, electrolyte balance has been uh, restored, uh, may be quite capable of making a decision uh, later in the day or, uh, or the following uh, day. So specific capacities with task specificity and temporal specificity are what competence is about uh, today. In anorexia nervosa, competence turns out to be a, a complex and, and I think very uh, interesting uh, issue. And the impairments that are seen are generally impairments in appreciation, including denial that there's a problem, skinny, I'm not skinny, uh, denial of the nature of the problem, you know, well, it's pancreatitis. I certainly don't have an eating disorder. Uh, and denial of the need for uh, treatment or the likely benefit uh, from uh, treatment. Uh, there's a uh, pediatric psychiatrist in England, a woman named Jessica Tan, who has uh, written uh, really uh, remarkable descriptions of the uh, reasoning of uh, patients with uh, anorexia, which if you're interested, uh, in the area, I, uh, I commend to you. Uh, but interestingly, despite these clear deficits, in fact, the deficits are built into the definition of the disease that you saw earlier uh, on the screen. Uh, anorexia patients are often not seen as being incompetent and are treated as if they were competent to make their own uh, treatment decisions because they retain superficial rationality. That is, you can chat with them about the weather or about the uh, uh, sports scores or about the latest uh, news, uh, and they seem like ordinary rational people. You can talk with them. They respond to you appropriately. Uh, there's no gross uh, disorientation. Uh, there are no delusions outside of their beliefs about uh, their body. It really seems to be a very focal deficit. Uh, and uh, in our uh, culture, in our uh, legal system, we have a great deal of trouble uh, dealing with those kinds of cases. Think about addictions. Uh, whether uh, somebody with a severe cocaine addiction is truly competent to make decisions about whether to get into treatment versus to go out and try and uh, score another hit on, on the street uh, right now is at least a debatable uh, issue. Uh, and yet we uh, have tended not to intervene coercively with uh, those people because they look superficially rational uh, and it makes us very uncomfortable uh, to take uh, those steps. Certainly true in anorexia. So now let's turn to Casey. Uh, the, one of the uh, three questions that was posed, can Casey be considered capable to make some decisions uh, but not others? Um, so first, is Casey incompetent with regard to making decisions about her anorexia? 
And my response, admittedly, I've not seen this woman. I, I've heard uh, only a relatively short uh, case summary, uh, is that she probably is uh, incompetent uh, to make those uh, decisions because she fails the appreciation test. She fails to appreciate, to recognize, uh, to grasp uh, the nature of uh, her illness, that it is an eating disorder, uh, and her need for treatment, given her really astonishing low, astonishingly low uh, body weight, although some of that was probably due to dehydration at the point of, uh, of admission. Nonetheless, this is a very severely ill anorexic patient who really doesn't believe that there's uh, anything uh, wrong. Is it inconsistent to attempt to declare her incompetent if she decided to leave the hospital, yet allow her to consent to the cholecystectomy, which is what was done? And I would suggest, in keeping with the discussion that we just had, uh, that the answer to that question is no. Uh, it's not inconsistent, because competence is task-specific. It's decision-specific. This may be a woman who was quite capable of understanding that she was having a problem with her gallbladder, which needed to be uh, removed, uh, but incapable of appreciating uh, that she had uh, an underlying problem uh, with her uh, relationship uh, to food. Third, where do decisions involving her anorexia begin and where do they end? So I would say that, that perhaps this is not the most pointed uh, question we could ask here. Uh, that the issue is not whether a decision involves her anorexia, meaning she might arguably be incompetent to make it, but whether with regard to any particular uh, decision, she can appreciate the nature of her condition and the need for treatment with regard to that piece of the decision. And if it turned out that for some aspect of her anorexia, she was able to do that, uh, then I would say she's likely competent to make a decision uh, about, that, uh, about that piece. And again, it's task specific, needs to be decided on a task by task uh, basis. Second major uh, overarching uh, question that was posed, what should Casey's condition uh, be called? So as, as we mentioned, the requirements for informed consent uh, include that uh, caretakers, physicians, uh, disclose the nature of the patient's condition. And ordinarily we do, and in many uh, conditions there's been a sea change in practice. So I'm sure many of you know that there was a survey done in the late 50s published in JAMA which showed that somewhere around 85 or 90 percent of physicians didn't tell their patients, their adult patients, uh, when they had a diagnosis of cancer. They would talk to the family members. Uh, if there were no family members, they might not talk to anybody. Uh, but they didn't tell the patient. It was just considered bad medical form. Uh, however, when that study was redone in the late 90s, 40 years later, the figures were almost uh, exactly uh, reversed. In fact, they were more than reversed. 95% approximately of physicians reported that they shared cancer diagnoses with their patients, it was the rare exception when family would be approached instead of uh, the patient, him or herself, uh, directly. So in general, we adhere to uh, this uh, requirement. But in a case like this, I think it's important to recognize that as physicians, we tend to think in diagnostic terms. We put labels on things. Um, but many patients don't put labels on things. Uh, and so in psychiatry, for example, it's not uncommon for us to deal with patients with schizophrenia or another psychotic disorder uh, who are resistant to the notion that they have a mental illness or that they uh, have schizophrenia per se uh, by avoiding the label uh, and simply putting it in other uh, terms. So some patients are willing to admit to strange ideas. Um, and when you see them in the clinic, you might uh, ask, how are you doing? Have those strange ideas come back and been bothering you? Oh, no, 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 they say. No, no strange ideas. Um, it is not essential to their care that they put the label we put on those uh, strange ideas. And I would suggest that it's not reasonable to insist that patients adopt our nomenclature uh, in general. The key is whether the information is adequate to make an informed 
uh, decision. And uh, in this case, the question was posed, is it ethical to provide treatment for anorexia while being complicit in Casey's denial? And I would respond by saying, look, if Casey can recognize something called starvation syndrome, which is a non-diagnostic term, but it's by no means a misleading term. That is what's going on with her body, at least her body, if, if not her, her mind. Um, but she can't accept anorexia. And if she can make an informed decision on that basis, well, you have star starvation syndrome. We need to implement behavioral therapies. We need to do uh, refeeding therapies. Uh, then I would say that the substitution of terms doesn't vitiate the validity uh, of her informed consent. But obviously there are limits. So if we told her, for example, that she had lupus, or she had Lyme disease, or she had something that was completely unrelated uh, to the underlying disorder, that, I, I think, moves over into the realm of, of deception uh, and would be problematic both from a legal and from an ethical uh, perspective. Finally, let me say something quickly about the differences in the treatment of minors uh, and adults. Obviously, adults get to make their own decisions. Minors can't make legally valid decisions. Somebody else has to make them. Uh, for them, you live with this uh, every day. Uh, but as you know, data suggests that somewhere around the age of 14, some people would say 12 to 14, um, minors' decisions begin to look a whole lot like adult decisions, both in the outcome and in the reasons that are offered uh, for uh, their choices. And so 14 and beyond, the rationale for ignoring their preferences diminishes. And it diminishes increasingly as they get closer to 18 or whatever the age of majority is for the particular uh, decision uh, at hand. So the final question that was posed is, should this case be resolved differently if Casey were 17 years old instead of being uh, of the age of majority? And at one level, one would have to say, well, yeah, if she were 17, consent would be obtained from her mother. Uh, but unless the patient were also herself incompetent, uh, there would be a bar, a fairly high bar, to imposing treatment over her uh, objections. And I, I've seen this in, in clinical settings uh, a good deal. And it, and it relates to that sense that I was talking about earlier, uh, that patients who have superficial rationality uh, make us uncomfortable if we try to ignore their decisions and impose uh, treatments uh, on them. Uh, so I would think that in practical terms, apart from the need for the mother's consent, case would probably be resolved in, in much the same way, although you may differ with me and I'd be interested to hear uh, your thoughts uh, as well. So those are the ends of, that's the end of my comments and, and let me stop uh, there. Thanks very much, Dr. Alboam. I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions or comments at this time and if you'd like to make your ways to the microphones here in the center. Well, it's being, it's being, uh, if you could make it to the aisle, that'd be better. You mentioned if she was a 17 or younger, that you would turn it over to the mother, but also you mentioned the mother had her own disordered eating patterns. It seems like, that you, did you say that or no? no? This, the, the rate is really high in in that situation, so I'd just like to know how, if the mother is facing the same kind of decision-making pattern. So just to clarify, the mother, my, my point in that slide was that the mother um, had denial of the patient's eating disorder, not her own. I meant how that would impact. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, you know, th there is an answer for uh, the question, but it, it gets into a very, very messy realm. The answer is, if a surrogate decision maker is him or herself not capable uh, of making uh, a decision, then um, we have the option of going to court, demonstrating that that in fact is the case, and having another surrogate appointed, perhaps in a case like this, the aunt, who seems to recognize the reality and the seriousness of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, I say it's very messy because um, 
the courts are very reluctant to take parental decision-making uh, rights uh, away. Uh, and uh, we're usually reluctant to alienate patients and families uh, in that way. Uh, then you're, you're uh, left with a situation where a mother or a father may try to pull the kid out of the hospital. You have to go through some sort of involuntary commitment or temporary guardianship process. It gets very complicated and, and, uh, and very messy. And you know, my, my suggestion would be in a case like that, you know, one first wants to do a full court press with the mother to see if you can break through the denial and get her to acknowledge what's actually uh, going on. But at least in theory, there's an option, there's an approach that can be taken. I don't know if you have a comment to this. or uh, I think one additional sort of challenging thing about this case in particular was that uh, with the patient being over 18, she actually refused to allow conversations alone with the mother. So it made it difficult to assess her level of de denial, but also to get her uh, engaged in being a part of um, engaging Casey in care. Right. So that, that's difficult as well. HIPAA, as you know, grants patients uh, fairly broad rights to, uh, to control their information. Uh, however, and here's where hospital attorneys or privacy officers can be extremely helpful in thinking things through, HIPAA does have a provision that allows physicians or other uh, health professionals to discuss with a person involved in the patient's care, and there's a particular phrase that characterizes that person, the details of the patient's treatment that are necessary for them to uh, be involved appropriately in their care. So there may be an out there even under HIPAA, although then you have to ask what Washington law would say uh, in that circumstance, and that's where hospital attorneys and privacy officers become uh, very helpful. Welcome to Seattle, and uh, please don't say too much about our weather in New York. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a quick comment, then a question. Um, you, you remind me that I suspect that the notion of, of uh, physician competence in relation to anorexia or any professional provider uh, competence may be an oxymoron. Uh, anorexia is just one of those situations that uh, is always a conundrum that's, that's difficult for us to deal with. Uh, I'm a child psychiatrist and I run into the situation with 13 year olds here uh, where they want confidence uh, from their parents uh, and I believe as I understand it and maybe other folks in this audience uh, can comment on this as well what are the limitations and what are the uh, what are the rights of that 13, 14 year old in relation to, to patient confidence uh, from their parents? Well, um, you know, th this is more of, I would suggest to you, a clinical issue than uh, it is uh, a legal uh, or ethical uh, issue. That is, um, the law is clear that patients have decision, that parents have decision making powers over uh, children who are uh, minors, and therefore any information that's needed to make those decisions can be discussed. Uh, with the parents. So there's no legal bar uh, to those uh, discussions. And I would suggest there's not really an ethical bar uh, either on the same grounds that uh, if they're going to be making uh, the choices on behalf of their kids, they need to know uh, what the underlying relevant information uh, is. But it is a clinical issue because you're worried about alienating your um, young adolescent or mid-adolescent uh, patient uh, who may just be getting to that age when they're able to exercise a little control uh, over their life and their circumstances, and this may be a very important issue uh, for them. Uh, practically, this can sometimes be worked out by a discussion with the parents, and I'm sure this is something that you would do in your practice uh, uh, quite frequently, which is to, uh, at the beginning of treatment, have a discussion about the importance of maintaining some degree of confidentiality about the patient's uh, condition uh, in order to enable effective treatment uh, to proceed. Most parents who are willing to bring their kids for treatment in the first place are willing to acquiesce uh, in that, at least initially, 
uh, and then it becomes a problem of managing the parent along with the child as, uh, as time goes on. But legally, ethically, I don't think there's a bar to those discussions. So I, I wanted to um, talk, get you to, to talk a little bit more about the issue of appreciation. And you gave this very um, good analogy with addiction as another example, like anorexia, where the problem in decision-making capacity is really at the level of appreciation, not fully appreciating what the consequences are. It seems to me that, at least pragmatically, that's, a, that's such a high bar that there's a, a very, very many people w with anorexia or addiction, for example, based upon that view would be considered not capable of making those decisions. So, and yet, often we don't, we don't actually act on that. So can you speak a little bit more to that disconnect between your comments and what we actually see playing out typically? Yeah, some years ago with a, a colleague uh, when I was still uh, in Massachusetts who, who treats uh, eating disorders, uh, we did a, a survey of major eating disorder centers um, around the country and in Canada and asked about the extent to which they used involuntary commitment uh, for their uh, patients uh, or appointments of a guardian, findings of incapacity and appointments of a, uh, of a guardian. Uh, and um, what we found at that point and what has been confirmed uh, since then, there was at least one other study that, uh, that followed ours, uh, was that in most places involuntary commitment appointment, de declaration of incapacity, uh, appointment of a, of a guardian is a very unusual event. Uh, even though for people who know anorexia, it seems pretty clear that these people, uh, people with, with the illness, are not able to appreciate, in many cases, uh, the nature of uh, what they're suffering from and that this leads to uh, uh, great difficulty in making reasonable treatment decisions. Um, so the question is why? Um, and I think the answer relates to, to what I was suggesting earlier about the power of superficial rationality. Um, that is, particularly in a society where we value individual choice, uh, where we don't like other people telling us what to do. We saw that again in Massachusetts. Uh, this week of all states. Um, the, the notion of taking decision-making power, particularly over someone's body, away from someone who looks like us, at least superficially looks like us, they can converse, they can interact, uh, is something that all the theory of decision-making competence aside, we don't take to uh, very well. Uh, it, it just seems to go against the grain. And so uh, I have thought for a long time that, uh, particularly in, in anorexia, but also with addictions, uh, and perhaps in other disorders uh, as well, uh, we are frequently reluctant to uh, declare someone or ask a court to declare someone incompetent uh, and impose treatment uh, against their will uh, when there might well be a, a strong rationale uh, for doing so. Perhaps not rational on our part, but certainly understandable on our part. Yeah, recently I was involved in a, another situation in which appreciation was an important issue. 16-year-old had been injured as a result of an automobile collision, suffered uh, multiple fractures of the pelvis. It was determined that in order for her to have any degree of future ability to walk that these fractures had to be repaired. Turned out that her family did not believe in any blood transfusions and the surgeons were unwilling to do any surgery unless they had that capability. Uh, this was a 16 year old and where she was embedded in a family that was very deeply religious and related to this issue. How, how do you assess her appreciation of her future inability to do or to walk in relationship to her ability to appreciate whether or not she can make that decision? 
Yeah. Um, so this relates to religious beliefs and uh, their impact on uh, appreciation and, and medical uh, decision making. Uh, and this is another area where, as a society, we have uh, a great deal of difficulty uh, in uh, addressing uh, the impact of uh, these beliefs on our, uh, on our capacities, on our patients' uh, capacities. Uh, we are very reluctant, and for understandable reasons, to intrude on people's uh, religious beliefs, even when they seem very discrepant and outside uh, generally accepted uh, scientific uh, views. Uh, and for adults, we have gotten to the point, although uh, there's, a, there's a classic uh, case I teach in my law school seminar uh, each year uh, from the early 1960s in which a uh, federal circuit court judge was willing to override the refusal of a Jehovah's Witness to have a blood uh, transfusion, which clearly... Uh, appeared to be uh, life-saving, uh, was willing to override it on essentially any grounds he could find. Uh, it looked like he just wasn't willing to let this woman die. Well, those attitudes have changed as far as adults are concerned. We are now willing to let people die uh, if their uh, religious beliefs, long held, uh, appear to... Uh, go against uh, a medical intervention that would be life-saving. Uh, but we're somewhat still struggling with what to do about kids. So for kids who are quite young, uh, were this a patient who was four years old or six years old or eight years old, probably even 10 years old, uh, the courts, I think, would be much less reluctant. And that's what you'd have to do. You'd have to go to court. But the courts would be much less reluctant to step in and to override uh, refusal. Uh, when kids get old enough that they have their own views and their own religious beliefs, which echo their parents' uh, religious beliefs, uh, we get a little more reluctant, we, the courts, get a little more reluctant uh, to do that because it feels very much like overriding an adult's objection uh, based on, on religion. And religion holds this special place when we start thinking about uh, these kinds of, of issues. We also have a harder time dealing with religious delusions that affect medical treatment decisions than non-religious uh, delusions. Uh, there's, a, there's a case from uh, New York, which is uh, sort of a, a classic example of this, in which a, uh, a young boy had a, uh, a cleft palate. Uh, which his father refused to have uh, treated surgically, although it, it could have been, for many years. And then finally, for reasons that aren't clear, the case makes its way to court when uh, the boy is in early adolescence. Uh, and uh, although the medical uh, testimony is unanimous that uh, it's treatable, the longer you wait, the less treatable it becomes, and there's likely to be huge impact uh, on his social development, his ability to speak, uh, et cetera, uh, the court declines uh, in a case very much like the one you're describing, although uh, not, uh, the, the father didn't belong to any uh, particular religious group. He just said he believed in natural healing, that you know, there were these forces in nature that would eventually uh, lead the cleft palate to heal. And the son had adopted this belief at the age of, 13 or 14 at the time this case is, uh, is being litigated. Uh, and the courts refused to, uh, refused to intervene. Uh, they said, let, let the boy become 18, let him think it through for himself, uh, and um, we're, we're simply not going to override the joint view of the father and the son uh, at that point. And to the extent that a 16-year-old has a similar view as uh, the family uh, does, the courts might be somewhat reluctant uh, to uh, override it. Now, of course, this is uh, pretty serious stuff. Uh, the ability to walk in the future, fractured uh, pelvis, is, is, not a, is not a light matter. Uh, and uh, you might find a court that is willing to be somewhat more interventionist. But it's not a sure thing either way. I mean, what would I do in a case like that? I'd probably go to court and leave it up to a judge and 
try to make the best case uh, I could for, uh, for the treatment. But I wouldn't be surprised uh, to get the answer back that uh, we, we are reluctant to tread on that ground. <clears throat> I'm a specialist in adolescent medicine here at Children's. I'm only peripherally involved with our eating disorder patients, but sometimes I need to see them because no one else is around or on the inpatient, uh, I uh, rotate through that <coughs> at the uh, uh, inpatient IPU. Um, especially the cases you just were talking about, I think this issue of what the real risks are and especially mortality uh, and that 6%, 6.2% or more, you know, would I think be very significant on decision making and, and perhaps what the court would decide. Um, I've been here almost four years. I've probably have been involved with more than 50 cases a year. So that would be, let's say, 200 cases. And we've had, as far as I know, zero mortality out of those 200, at least in the fairly short term. But then we follow them outpatient. So some of them and other doctors follow them much more frequently and for years. So I'd be interested in Kim commenting on that issue and then perhaps how that affects the ethical issue. Yeah, I think that's an issue I've struggled with, um, not so much with this case but with another case that I have um, in terms of what constitutes an imminent risk of harm um, in a patient, particularly one who's over 18, um, and for which the legal bar is much higher to involuntarily commit somebody to treatment. Um, so I would be interested to hear um, Dr. Applebaum's response as well to that uh, question, but I agree with you that it is a difficult assessment because while the lifetime prevalence of mortality um, related to this disorder is quite high, at, a, at any given time um, it is a difficult assessment to make. So, you know, statistics I think just get you so far and then you have a particular case uh, in front of you. It may be that 6.2 percent in general, but 0 percent you know, in a specialty center like this with uh, excellent uh, care, uh, go on to, uh, to die as a result of the disorder. But this girl almost died as a result of this disorder. Whatever she was doing, frying herself uh, on that beach uh, and provoking acute renal failure is pretty scary stuff. So to me, this is a high risk uh, patient and, and uh, the risk of mortality is, is very real and was almost uh, a uh, hundred percent, given uh, given how she behaved, and to me that's a strong impetus to to move ahead and and uh, uh, and try and uh, implement effective treatment, if possible with her cooperation. If all it takes is to call it something else, that's fine. But if not, uh, to try to seek authorization for uh, for override of her uh, of her decision. Uh, in the case of. Uh, the possible consequence of not being able to walk and other outcomes which may in the future place a burden on society to provide specialized care at public expense for such outcomes. What is the what are, what's the role or the rights of society in these cases? Well, you know, the truth is that as far as our uh, courts are concerned in addressing these cases, um, they have um, been reluctant to ask that question or to have that question factor into uh, their decision making. Uh, whether that's a sustainable position over the long run, people have strong and varying uh, opinions about. Uh, but uh, when these cases get litigated, they tend to be decided on the basis of individual rights and whether somebody uh, in this circumstance has the right to make the decision that they're making uh, without focus on the long-term societal consequences, including the long-term uh, societal uh, costs. Well, let's end there. Thank you for your questions, and let's give uh, Dr. Abelbaum and Dr. Ahrens a round of applause.
Thank you. Yes, sir. Who should make the decisions in terms of the specific issue is that we, I think, tend to grapple with the I think that's the problem.